Okay, so lesson two with regards to free energy is going to really harken back to everything from lesson one in terms of the idea of energy being transformed, okay? Because ultimately when we think about energy being neither created nor destroyed and how we need to keep eating to replenish that energy supply, uh, some energy is wasted as heat and the rest is used in reactions. So when we look at those exothermic reactions where it's generating that excess energy, some of it is wasted, but some of it is utilized, okay? And this is the concept that I really wanted to try to connect to lesson one with regards to lesson two in terms of free energy, that combination of uh, if energy is in some way, shape, or form generated from that exothermic reaction, how is that energy going to be utilized? So again, looking at that second law of thermodynamics and that energy transfer, some energy will be unusable. That thermal energy gets wasted as heat. That is why our bodies produce heat. We produce heat as waste energy for the most part. Any reaction our body goes through produces that waste thermal energy, which is why our bodies operate at a specific temperature. All that waste energy is generated as a result of these metabolic processes. These unusable energies will increase entropy of the universe. Entropy is the concept or the measure of disorder in a system. Entropy can increase, um, entropy increases as that energy is released into the universe, into a system. Uh, so thermal energy or heat we release causes particles to increase motion and they become less organized. That less organization uh, is, can be good and bad depending on how much energy and how much heat is released. But the chemical reactions that break large things into small ones are, are definitely the things that are going to create that uh, entropy or that excess thermal energy that is unusable. So I don't want to spend too much time with regards to talking about it, but that energy requirement of our body to, to maintain that ordered structure, it's as a result of that entropy. As that thermal energy, that entropy is released into the system, that law of entropy states that we need to continue to put energy in to fight entropy of that breakdown of those energy rich foods. So it's kind of this self repeating paradoxical cycle in that if we release thermal energy and waste products into the universe, uh, it's going to impact the way that our systems work. And so it's going to cost energy to keep those systems in check. And in order to keep putting energy into our systems, we have to consume more food. And in order to use that energy, we have to break the food down. And, and so continues this cycle, this entropic cycle that is life, for lack of a better word. So when we look at spontaneity, um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about these two ideas, but the, the general idea about spontaneity is that these chemical reactions and, and biological processes are considered spontaneous. Uh, if they could continue on their own once started without a constant supply of energy, um, it's going to continue, right? So ultimately, if that reaction or process is non-spontaneous, uh, it will require continuous energy input. So there are some factors that are going to be continuous versus uh, or spontaneous versus non-spontaneous with regards to biological life. So it's important to determine whether a process will happen spontaneously or not. And in order to do that, you got to take in three things into consideration. Energy change, temperature, and ironically enough, spontaneity, right? So if there is an equation for this, uh, but we won't need to use it for this class, uh, you'll worry about that in first year biochemistry. And ultimately, it's, it's not something I want to spend too, too much time on because ultimately uh, recognizing that there are some spontaneous and non-spontaneous things that happen um, and how we can make use of both of those reactions. When we talk about spontaneous, we're talking about, yeah, I, I won't get into detail with it. So Gibbs free energy uh, is a theory or an idea that energy that is not lost during this process, uh, but is in, in fact available to us during, or called free energy. So this Gibbs free energy idea is that the, the lost thermal energy can in some way, shape, or form be utilized. So this change in free energy, or delta G, represents the difference between, in free energy between the final state of molecules, i.e. the products of the reaction, as compared to the free energy of those initial states. So again, that concept of entropy or exothermic reaction, or sorry, exothermic versus endothermic reactions, we're looking at that G final minus that G initial. And that delta G helps us to determine the amount of free energy between the product and those reactants. So this is where we start to get into the underpinning idea of like, okay, it's an exothermic reaction and energy is, is gonna be, can be released and utilized. 
how much of that energy can we utilize? We're looking at Gibbs free energy equation to help us determine that. So if delta G is negative, then that reaction can happen spontaneously, right? That reaction can happen spontaneously, meaning it doesn't need a continuous supply of energy and because it produces free energy. So we call these exergonic reactions, okay? We call these exergonic reactions. These exergonic reactions are as a result of a negative delta G and they can happen spontaneously, i.e. it doesn't need a continuous energy supply. If our delta G is positive, we call those endergonic reactions. This reaction cannot happen spontaneously and it will require a supply of free energy. We call these endergonic. So again, the, the use of the prefixes exo and endo are going to really help us understand the idea how they relate to ex exothermic and endothermic reactions because they are going to have some relation to each other in terms of delta G or Gibbs free energy. So looking at this free energy component with regards to some graphs that we've kind of seen before. Okay, free energy is usable, okay, free energy is usable energy, i.e. it's not going to be thermal energy. When we talk about thermal energy, it's contributing to entropy, we can't really utilize that thermal energy. We can utilize free energy, but we cannot utilize that thermal energy in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so this chart here is going to show that exergonic, that exergonic reaction where free energy from reactants to products, that change, that delta, is that free energy that we can utilize. Likewise, with regards to the endergonic reactions, uh, we need to supply free energy to drive these reactions. Okay, we need to supply free energy to drive these reactions. When you start to take into consideration exergonic and exothermic and endergonic and endothermic reactions, and you start to think about how similar those words are, you're going to have to understand and realize that um, they are related. So when you need to think about delta G equation for the quiz, all that delta G equation really is, is looking at the difference between the energy of the reactants and products. Uh, they're very, very similar in that context. So both of those concepts are, are definitely going to have to know for the quiz as they are going to be connected to each other in terms of exothermic endothermic reactions and exergonic and endergonic reactions. So, and again, one thing to, to remember for this is that delta G is negative for exergonic reactions, much like that delta uh, product or that delta energy was negative for exothermic reactions. And then delta G is positive for endergonic reactions. That delta energy will be positive as well for endothermic reactions when you're doing that chemical bond calculation. So the parallels are unavoidable. So what are some examples of Exogon or exergonic and endergonic reactions or reactions in general. Let's take a look at cellular respiration. Okay, cellular respiration is the use of sugar and oxygen to create energy, water, and carbon dioxide. If we were to calculate all that energy in terms of the in terms of those bonds, we would find that there's going to be a net negative energy. That delta G is going to be negative. Okay, delta G is negative, therefore it's going to be an exergonic reaction. It will happen spontaneously, meaning you do not have to uh, supply it with free energy in order to drive that reaction, and it will in fact produce free energy to utilize, which makes sense because everything we talk about with regards to cellular respiration is looking at the creation of energy to do work in the cell. When we look at photosynthesis, however, the key difference here, and, and it's something that my hope is that you've remembered from grade 10 or grade 11 biology, is that sunlight needs to be utilized for this reaction. So right off the bat, without really thinking too much, you should know that it's gonna be a non-spontaneous reaction. There's gonna be a positive delta G, meaning it is an endergonic reaction. And that means that energy needs to be put into that, uh, that I guess, that reaction in order for it to happen. This, these two com like combined principles, oh, I'll highlight that better. This will help us to look at things called coupled reactions. And these coupled reactions are the idea that exergonic and endergonic reactions are going to happen together. And that free energy released from reactions is used to make endergonic reactions happen. And the 
ultimate uh, idea of biology, specifically with this unit and metabolic processes, is the, the recognition that we are going to look at all of these reactions working in conjunction. So when calculating delta G, we do final initial, but then when calculating bond energy, we did initial final. Why is that? Uh, because we're looking at it from left to right in terms of energy, uh, from left to right for exergonic, or sorry, for exothermic and endothermic. With regards to exogonic and endergonic, we're just looking at it in terms of the change in energy. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit when we do some practice questions. Uh, but looking at these coupled reactions, these coupled reactions are going to happen, oops, happen together. Okay, so when you look at that note that I have here, that A to BC and DE to F, we're looking at that general equation, the general equation of how these two reactions can happen together. So when we look at that free energy release from exergonic reactions and then utilizing it to perform endergonic reactions, it, it's really here we're just looking at that non-spontaneous versus spontaneous reactions, taking advantage of that spontaneous to create non-spontaneous reactions. So these coupled reactions, we combine uh, the delta G values to find an overall delta G value. And whatever that value is, we can determine whether it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous overall as a coupled reaction. Because of what I will ask for, for people to do eventually is looking at coupled reactions to determine if the overall reactions in total are going to be spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So you'll have to understand how to find the entire delta G for all of the reactions to determine whether the, all the reactions are spontaneous or not. So when we look at catabolic reactions, breaking large particles into smaller ones, and anabolic reactions, building large particles into smaller ones, we can start to determine which are exergonic or endergonic based off of the type of reaction and which pathways they use. So the pathways are a set of reactions that happen in sequence. We will spend a lot of time in this unit looking at all of the different pathways that start to finish will produce or use energy in an attempt to have, for the most part in, in metabolic reactions, an overall net gain of energy from all of the different steps and processes. So ultimately, when we look at this total um, metabolic pathway reaction, all the way from start to finish, from the catabolic pathway, we look at that net negative kilojoules per mole. So that overall delta G is going to be negative and it's going to give energy off into the system to utilize. When we're looking at that anabolic pathway, which builds particles, it's going to require an energy input. So the, the thing that I really want to focus on for this last little bit of this section here, because this to me ties it, everything in together from the first lesson and this lesson. These two principles, these catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions, when you just think about what they're trying to do, when you just think about what they're trying to do, metabolic breaks large particles into small ones. The act of breaking those bonds up, it needs to produce energy. It needs to produce energy. The whole premise of metabolic reactions as a whole, specifically with digestion, it's to create that energy within the cell. So metabolic and creation of energy need to go hand in hand. And I, I say creation of energy, I, I mean creation of free energy for the cell to use. Anabolic reactions, they are building large particles from small ones. You cannot, you cannot build something without an input of energy. So we would expect all of that anabolic pathway, that all of that anabolic pathways that we see in the body, they have to be endergonic. Energy needs to go into them to happen. Okay, folks, that's it for lesson two. I know lesson one and lesson two are, are I, I wouldn't say it's, material that's too, too heavy in terms of content amount, but it's dense in terms of the general big ideas that you need to be responsible for, which is why I really wanna, this, this entire day is spent to understanding on how these processes, big ideas function, and then we'll look at the specifics as we move through the rest of this unit. So I'll give you some time to digest it, both this period, uh, rest of this period, next period, and over lunch, and then we will come back to the afternoon and look at some more of lesson three.